church, she did the offering. Like, I, I feel like I'm just supposed to do the benediction at this point. Like, you know, we did everything else. How's everybody feeling? Y'all good? Yeah. All right. First of all, thank you for being here. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and so we appreciate that. Um, so this, this is going to be a very free-flowing conversation. I don't have no cards. I don't have, I mean, we just, we talk, we know each other. Three-man weave. We talk, <laughs> yeah, the three-man weave. Um, but we're going to start with um, the most important question first. Um, and as I ask questions, y'all can ask questions too. I'm moderating on the flyer, but you know, it's, it's a conversation. So most important question, we'll start with that one first. Kendrick or Drake? I knew I was coming. Not even a question. <laughs> uh -oh. Overall, body of work, Drake. But in terms of this most recent battle, Kendrick. Kendrick clearly, without a doubt, body Drake. And I think it's time for Drake to take a step aside with his fast, quick H&M music and give some time and space for some timeless music. All right. Who do you think? Obviously Kendrick. Yes, sir. It's not a question. The revolutionary in me will not allow me to do Drake for body of the music or the battle. So. Kendrick, all the way across. All right, so the origin story. Mm -hmm. So we are 10 years in, it's crazy. Crazy. It's crazy. We old. And I'm <laughs> older, <laughs> so <laughs> then there's that. So for those of you who don't know, I just look like I'm the same age as them. I'm nine years older than them. That's uh, crazy. I know, which is wild. Wow. Um, so yeah, thank y'all, see look, they, they know. <laughs> I was like the big brother in the house, babysitting, no. <laughs> I think we, we all grew together, and I think that that is one of the things that I love about our story is that we got to see each other mature, grow, and really become the men that we are for our communities kind of through this process. Um, so I'll let you, you two kind of start with the origin story and we'll kind of, um, Talk about like how it's moved forward. Mm -hmm. um, also, shout out to Hal Bowling, who's in the Go. building. He's a very important part of the story. Um, and when we got started, he was one of our kind of mentors, and uh, he helped kind of guide us through this process. But so I'll, I'll hand it off to, to Derek and Jimmy to start. You want to start with how you moved to Cincinnati? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Or, or how I found out that you're in Cincinnati. Which one? <laughs> oh, boy. You should have just said Kendrick. Oh, okay. <laughs> I bet Alan listens to Drake in the shower. <laughs> so, wow. Me and Billy went to college together. And uh, we've known each other for a really long time. And I was living in Indianapolis at the time. And um, a person that was dating and I decided to visit Cincinnati, see what it was about. And Billy gave us one of his amazing tours of the city. And he convinced us to move to Cincinnati. So while we were moving, see a Jim Crossett, one of our first board members, amazing human being, <laughs> kept us out of jail. Uh, it is true. Uh, so as we were moving, like many couples, sometimes in high stress situations, we fought. And she broke up with me, and it was tragic. And then Billy, being the great guy that he is, allowed me to live on his couch for a short amount of time. Three months. A couple weeks. <laughs> and you know, I was a little sad. I'm, we're all Pisces, if you didn't know that. And part of my emotional outlet was going out and experiencing the city and crying sometimes. And we would walk out through over the ride, and we would see all these new bars and restaurants that were opening, and these new stores and we would enjoy them. But then on the way back, we would see folks who look like us who were doing things like selling t-shirts or offering you a ride. And we saw there was this underground economy that was operating kind of underneath the surface. And we thought, well, what could over the ride be if all these people, regardless of where they came from, could participate in the revitalization that was happening around them? And that's where Billy and I thought, well, maybe we could start an entrepreneurship program um, that could support entrepreneurs. 
Alan and I met when I was living in Indianapolis, because Alan is an entrepreneur who's done amazing things, started his career. He's someone I respected for a really long time. I'm being really long-winded. No, you're good. <laughs> Captive audience. Okay. <laughs> we, so, Blue and I decided we would pitch this idea uh, that would eventually become Mortar, and we won $5,000, right? Maybe even only 2,500. It was something yeah, so small. It was small, small grant. And me and Billy were like, oh shit, we got to actually do something now. <laughs> I knew Alan was in Cincinnati, so we asked Alan to talk to us at the library, and it was the most awkward conversation in the history of conversations. And luckily, Alan, being the person that he is, saw the vision, and he believed what we were trying to do, and we decided that we were better working together to see what we can do collectively to make sure that everybody in Cincinnati could participate in what was happening in our past ability. Yeah, I remember the day we pitched, we pitched this idea at Rheingeist, and we were working at KnowledgeWorks at the time, and we were testing out the idea up in the boardroom while we were supposed to be taking phone calls and whatnot. <laughs> we show up at Rheingeist, like some dingleberries, we have you know, our tucked in shirts and our blazers and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I remember we had my girlfriend at the time make a quick deck. It was five slides and we won somehow. We had like somehow. five people in the, the audience. But I think from that we knew that there was something behind it and that there was this idea and belief that more could be done in our neighborhood OTR at the time and also throughout the city. So when we started it was just the idea of just doing one class and over to Rhine. And then that's, I think, when Alan also came in and was like, yo, there's so much more that we can push and, and shift in our city from this. Yeah, so my, my background is in, my degree is actually in graphic design. My background is in everything visual arts. So I came in initially thinking about, you know, how can I create this brand that, you know, people will see and respect, like, from the gate. Um, and I wanted it to look a lot bigger than three people. Like, so that was kind of what I was tasked with initially. So when we first came in, I think that one of the cool things was that we also had three entirely different backgrounds, even though they were both working at the same place. Um, Derek had a background kind of in fundraising and development. Billy had done some stuff with nonprofits here and in Africa. My background, again, is in design, and I've just been an entrepreneur for my whole life. I've been a photographer since I was 12. So it was like, how could we all collaborate, stay in our lanes because we all brought something different to uh, kind of the, the pot and you know, get together and figure out what that could look like. Um, so ultimately, we put out flyers. Uh, we started to really talk about this initiative, say, hey, this is something that we think is uh, value and people will appreciate. And we got three applications. <laughs> And we looked at each other like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, I thought, I thought we was on to something. It was like, but we only got three applications. We were sharing it everywhere. Everywhere. And then um, the business courier did an article. Mm. And from there, it kind of was like everything fell into place. We, we had a guy who called us and was like, hey, I saw in the article that you're looking for a place to hold the classes. And Billy was... Uh, he was unable to, to attend, I think it was just me and Derek, and we went and met this guy named Scott in his office on uh, Vine Street. And he was like, you know, I got this other business where I do plastics, and I do this kind of on the side. It was a venture capitalist. He was like, but I'm not really in my office. You guys, like, you can use the office, you know, whenever you need to. And Derek, being Derek, he was like, this sounds sketchy. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, why do you want to help us? <laughs> and the guy was like, do you believe in God? And he was like, because I feel like God is telling me to do this for you guys. Mm. And I was like, I believe in God, and I believe you should listen to him. <laughs> I'm down. So we actually took over his office. He ended up moving out. We took over the lease. Um, and... Um, during that process, he was asking us, like, what else do you want to do? I was like, you know, I had a dream about doing a store. I was like, I've never wanted to have a store. It's weird. I don't know why I had this dream. And he's like, follow me. And then we, then we both <laughs> looked at each other like, we, we don't know this man. <laughs> like, get out, hadn't came out yet, but it felt like that. He was like, he grabbed his keys. We followed him randomly into this other storefront that was right next door. And that actually became our first pop-up shop. 
because uh, he was like, is this enough room? He was like, I'm just using it for storage. He had literally like a one box you. and one ladder in his whole <laughs> storefront. And I was like, that's not really a good usage of storage. But, but it was perfect for us because it made a great spot for us to do our pop-up shop. And so the dream that I had about the store kind of became the, the vision of the pop-up shops. Um, and then from there, we just kind of took the, the thing forward. But you remember the, uh, the first article that came out and the, uh, the commentary under it on Twitter? Oh, yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah. That's... The, yeah. What they say? Oh, I, I almost got put out. As soon as I got pulled in, I almost got put out. <laughs> I was run, I was on social media. I was young and dumb. And for those of you who know me, when I say revolutionary, like that's my thing. Um, what was your old moniker? Listen, the brand, uh, branding gladiator. So it was like everything. Gladiator. I'm fighting whatever it comes down to. Like I'm fighting for whatever is important. <laughs> Somebody got on our, on our post. It was like y'all, y'all just three young suits and basically tried to say that we had we were out of touch with the community had no connection with black people as a whole and, and this was a white man who told us this but needless to say derek sent me a text i was like get off social media <laughs> <laughs> delete the, delete those tweets so i did <laughs> oh. but i think that that's a testament to our willingness to step out are a testament to our willingness to fight for the things that we believe in. And I think that that really set the foundation for who we became as three entrepreneurs um, who became brothers through the process, who fought like brothers through the process. But ultimately, when things weren't going how we wanted them to go, we always looked at each other and said, this is not about us. Right. That was one of the things that was a common theme. Whenever it felt like it was starting to get personal or whenever it felt like it was something that was going on. It was like, this isn't about us. This is about our people. This is about the people that we want to serve through this process. This is not about us. And so we were able to remove ourselves, remove our egos, remove our Pisces tendencies and emotions from that and, and move forward. So I, I'm super grateful for that and thankful. Tell me, Brian, first pitch on you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So at Esoteric, for those of you who were here last month, we talked about Brian being uh, one of our graduates, and not only one of our graduates, but he won our first pitch night. Uh, we're an investor in Esoteric, and so we continue to make sure that we're supporting through being able to do events and bring community and, and stay in touch with people through that process. So, question. As you have gone through this journey of founding Mortar, uh, what has been the thing that you learned about yourself through that process? Mm. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. Did you got to answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think one early on was to not take things personally. Um, and that was hard. And I think when we were starting out, we were, you know, pushing a lot of boundaries of what has been done here in Cincinnati. and and maybe stepping on toes of people who felt like they were doing a lot of the similar work. And starting out, it was really hard, you know, looking up at people that I felt were, you know, people I looked up to, people that were mentors in many ways, pushing back so heavily. Um, and from that, I think we learned that it's not about what we are doing. It's a lot of what's going on within themselves and maybe own insecurities and that do not let that drive what we believe to be true and what we believe to be possible. Still thinking. Still thinking. I think for me, for me I think the, the one thing that I learned about myself through this process is to, to choose the battles. Um, because like I said, like that's that's my nature. Like when it goes, I'm a protector too. So like whenever something goes down, like I'm the first one in. Um, but being able to choose battles and to understand what it looks like to, to kind of pause in those times, you know, to reflect. Um, there's been a lot of maturity just through this process in general and through you know, therapy and just like getting a better understanding of like self-awareness and, and who I am and who I 
ultimately want to be. And so I think that that's been one of the things that was a major thing for me and a, and a major lesson through this process is how to choose those battles and then also how to um, find your real allies you know, through that process because there are people who will fight with you um, and not fight against you. And there are people who are, there are a lot of, a lot of people in the room um, who have been in our corner from day one. I mentioned how uh, Eric from the city, like we have always been able to have, you know, if we have questions, like, you know, when we're not understanding processes and uh, he's able to kind of walk us through that. Go. Um, and uh, Alicia from Go. US Bank, like she has, Alicia is like, she's become one of my really good friends. And like, I, I can, I can have real conversations with Alicia and it's not like, I don't feel like I'm talking to a funder. You know what I mean? Like we have real conversations about where mortar could be, you know, she gives advice, she, she listens, um, and she's also put us in position. So I'm actually on the, the National US Bank um, Community Advisory Council due to a recommendation from Alicia. And I've been on there for almost six years now. And so knowing that we have people in our corner who will lift us up and who will help to get us to that, that place. John Jewett from uh, Duke Energy Now, but also uh, from, at, at the time from the city of Cincinnati, even uh, like with our, our homecoming event, came to the event the day of to sign our, uh, our uh, permits because we were like, things were not going like they were supposed to. He was like, he came on a random Saturday, it's like, I got you and sign it. I mean, so there's just a lot of people in the room that have been in our corner. And so it, it's, that was the other thing is, is finding those allies and really being able to connect with people on a human level. If I had to say one thing, I think I used to really struggle with receiving criticism mm -hmm. and thinking that the person delivering that information to me hated me, thought I was a failure, that I was a failure, and I really struggled with hearing difficult, potentially negative feedback from people, and I realized it's okay, you know? Sometimes in order to grow, you have to have honest conversations, and you have to be introspective, and allow folks the space to tell you how they really feel. I'll tell you, working in a restaurant, you learn very easily how to, deliver, how to handle direct feedback. Um, but I would say that my training started at Mortar, especially at some of our leadership meetings. <laughs> Shout out to Sadell. Sadell, we were like Sadell. <laughs> Gave me some good training on how to handle direct feedback. Uh, to now where I think, you know, it's a part of life. Uh, it's a part of existing as a human and understanding that you can take that information as it is and you can let it go. and that relationship can still survive. And I think Alan was saying that the three of us, I really consider us brothers because we have been in the trenches with each other and gone through every kind of emotion that you can imagine. And I know that if we can go through those things together and come out on the other side as strong as our bond is, what else can we do? That's right. That's right. You got a question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you look like you were ready. So, um, as many of you know, in December 2019, Derek and Billy, um, they broke up the band <laughs> <laughs> to pursue their solo careers. And um, they've both gone on to do amazing things that we're, we're super proud of. And even as like Mortar, Derek is technically on paper, maybe. Technically, what? <laughs> well, he's a Mortar grad. <laughs> <Shame>. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> so we've oh, been man. super supportive of Pate Roja, um, and um, yeah, shout out to her. Um, so I'm gonna get to you in a second, but Billy has uh, also done some amazing things with community building with uh, his sister Destiny and Cincy Nice. But uh, yeah, shout out to you. And they're also operating Five Points, uh, which is literally right behind the, the Derner building that we'll be in, so we'll be neighbors again. Um, but for Derek, 
in thinking about Pate Roja, um, actually, I'm going to start with one question for both, and then we'll go to your individual story. But for entrepreneurs, sometimes it can be challenging to know when it's time to go. Um, how do you, or what advice would you give to somebody who is in a business right now? And sometimes it could be that the business isn't going in the way they thought it was. Sometimes it could be, I mean, there's any number of reasons why people choose to end a business or end a partnership or end, like what advice would you give to somebody who is considering kind of their next move um, and what's in their, their journey? Uh, my first response is, I shared this a couple weeks ago, is you have to really love what you do because entrepreneurship is so hard. And a lot of times I really miss Alan and Billy because I feel like at least we had each other. And now, you know, I'm off sometimes with my own. And it's sad. We love you, man. <laughs> I miss my guys. <laughs> But, you know, I got to wake up every day and do the same thing all over again. And I got to be the person who's my biggest cheerleader. And if you don't have the intestinal fortitude to get yourself up, hike yourself up and keep moving forward, don't do it. Because it's going to eat you up alive. And it's going to be tough for you and the folks in your circle if you aren't really passionate and in love and have the perseverance to work through the everyday challenges of entrepreneurship, of which there are so many. So I would say the first thing is have an honest conversation with yourself and ask yourself, is this really what I want to do? Because a lot of times I think, I was sharing with how I was joking, there are a lot easier ways to make money than being your own boss. Thanks. Ditto to all he said. I think when I was thinking about the next step to take, uh, I told them this, I like, there's a moment when you feel like you're at your best with an organization or a, an idea. And I started to feel like I was at my best with mortar. And if I would have stayed, I would not have had the same energy and I would have became more complacent. And I think it's important that when you're at your best and you feel like that momentum to continue on to we are where you can take that energy. Turn, turn that speaker just a little bit that way. There we go. There we go. There. <laughs> uh, where you can keep the energy going in a different direction. And I think that's what I felt with uh, starting Cincy Nice with my sister, is that at Mortar I had hit my point where I was like, I don't want to take away from what we're creating. And I think we have put the energy in that will continue to build as it has with all this incredible team and folks across the, the city and country that's still growing, and I, I think that's where we're at. Since you're talking, I'll just ask you first. So, starting Cincy Nice, kind of tell us what that journey has looked like. Tell us about some of the events that you have been a part of, partnerships that you formed, and then also, you get to work with a family member, your sister, every single day. Um, Talk a little bit about what it looks like to navigate kind of the duality of that relationship of her being your sister, but then also being a business partner. Yeah. It's hard, but I think when I reflect on it, same with starting a business with you, same with starting a business with my sister, I would much rather be in business and spend time with people day in and day out that I truly love and care about even if it is the hardest thing possible, I think that means so much more to me. Uh, we started officially on the second day of lockdown. We were not gonna start yet, but then out of nowhere the shit, the shit came and we're like, hit up the bank, we're like, can you open the doors up for us so we can actually start a business account? We came in all masked up, probably shouldn't even been in there. So early on, we were shifting and pivoting what we were gonna be. And instead of being more of uh, straight up entertainment focus, we shifted to what problems can we start to solve in our city. So our first big installation was during the George Floyd protest when we shut down like three blocks of Main Street, took down all the, the boarded up windows that had um, art put on them and set them up for one long table for us to actually have authentic and genuine conversations, leading with black folks sitting at the table first and inviting our other friends in uh, to actually have real conversation 
instead of just the yelling that we felt was happening. Um, and from there, we've continued to shift, and we're fortunate enough we're on the, the Blink team now and putting that on this year. Very excited about that. And I think also, you know, part of our role is not about the two of us, is that we create this entity, Cincy Nice, that people, you know, respect. And with that, we want to push on the, you know, the powers that be on, on a lot of things we don't believe in and that we think are doing wrong and, and shift on hopefully how we can create a more equitable city, a more inclusive city, a city that appreciates and funds black arts the same way they fund white art across the city and hopefully shift some of those powers throughout our city. That is what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's going on. One, of, one of the things, I actually just had a, a memory that popped in my head. There's so many over the 10 years, it's just crazy to keep up with. But I remember when we heard about Sam DeVos. Mm. And we, again, we were on Vine Street, our that. office was not even this size, <laughs> but we invited people in to our office to, to have a conversation. So when you were talking about, about the, our that. tables uh -huh. event and having authentic conversations, we did that, and we were early in. Like, we were like, we don't know what to do. There are people who are protesting. There are people who are yelling. There are people who want to have conversations. There's people who are crying. What can we do? And we created a space. Yeah. And I think that that was something that was very different about what we did at that time. And I had forgotten all about it until you mentioned the Our Tables event, because that was something that was important to us. Community has always been ingrained in everything that we did. You know, it was like, what does our community need right now, and how can we create a platform for them to be able to express themselves, to be able to connect, to be able to speak, to be able to share, or whatever the thing is. Um, so I love that you've continued that on with your mission with Cincy Nice and some of the things that you're doing over there. So Derek, um, when you think about your journey with Pate Roja, it started kind of pre, uh, before you left Mortar, Talk about like what it looked like to kind of dip your toe in, um, then making the decision that you were going to do it full time with the trailer. Then now you like in a full blown brick and mortar that I can't even get in because it's always a million people in line. I'm gonna have to leave, leave. I need like a VIP window or something in the back, like just bring mine to the back door. But like tell us about how that journey started for you and how you started to pursue that other passion? Um, well, I've been making tacos for a while for my friends and I had this passion for making tacos but I knew at the time, at least I felt at the time, that there weren't resources for people who look like me, I felt, to pursue that dream, to open that brick and mortar. So I decided it'd be best to start with you all uh, to, to have Mortar act as that conduit to support other entrepreneurs. To do that first and then hope that one day there'd be a time where I could pursue my own dreams. I also knew from our experience working with entrepreneurs that it's best to test your ideas, test the market, and see if there is an actual desire for people to support your business. And I've seen people like Kristen Bailey and so many other queer entrepreneurs come out of Mortar's program and you see how they built it step by step by step. It gave me a lot of inspiration to see maybe I could do something about it. So Billy was my first investor. Hey. And Billy loaned me $1,000 to uh, go on eBay and buy a taco cart that I, I think it was like for, bar, uh, not a bar, it was for uh, like King Sierras. And it had these like wheels that fell off anytime you rolled it down the street. <laughs> it was not great, but we made it work and I would do these small pop-ups with friends, and people would keep coming back and they keep encouraging me to keep going. And that's where I thought, hmm, maybe there's something here. So I thought, well, how can I learn more? And that's when I applied for Mortar's program, and Alan gave me a hard time, but eventually I got in, <laughs> somehow. And I'm a proud graduate <laughs> of class 21. He was like, I work here, I'm a founder, how come I can't get in the class? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a proud graduate of class 21, and I kept doing these pop-ups, and people kept coming back. So I was like, okay, maybe there's something here. And Rosedale, I forgot. And, Rosedale. I, and we had this uh, little kitchenette <laughs> thing at Rosedale for our entrepreneurs, 
And I knew the opportunity was there, so I decided to try to squeeze my way in. And I was doing it on Sundays. And the owners of a bar from around the corner called Bar Seso would come in and they eat our tacos and they asked me if I'd be interested in doing my tacos there. So I thought it could be a good idea. So that's where we partnered on a food trailer that we had for two years. And I learned a lot. And sorry, I should also say, when that happened, the pandemic also happened too. So I had that food trailer open and operating in the midst of the pandemic, which was a very difficult time, but also it teaches you a lot about resilience. And it teaches you a lot about creativity. It teaches you a lot about taking your product to your customers when there's a whole bunch of barriers. So in a lot of ways, it was a great thing for me to go through because I had to learn on the fly how to really be an entrepreneur. But 3CDC um, had some opportunities on Court Street and they asked if I'd be interested in occupying one of their new storefronts. At first I said no, because I did not want to have a restaurant. I thought food truck is my way to go. I don't want to do it. But eventually they convinced me and that was, um, it took a year for us to open up. And um, we opened up on February 8th of this year and it's been an amazing, amazing, amazing experience. Uh, to go from that small cart on the corner to now uh, having a storefront, we actually are going to be a part of Taste of Cincinnati uh, next week. Silver one. And yeah, so this is, this is my greatest accomplishment in my life. I'm so proud of this. I think a lot, I'm going to take what the accomplishment is. <laughs> I will be honest and transparent and say, I have imposter syndrome. I did not go to culinary school. I have worked in kitchens, but I've never been a cook. So I always have this thought in the back of my head that people come to Potterova because they like me and they want to see me succeed. And the food is secondary to that. We uh, entered our burrito tacos into the Taste of Cincinnati's Best Entree contest, and we got silver. That's crazy. I can't believe it. But that was an objective group of people that judged our food, and we got second place. And I'm really, really proud about that. So that's our story. Yay. Beautiful. Yay. That's a good deal. What did it look like for you to put in the work, though? Because I feel like we you didn't talk about all of the training and all of the kind of tutelage that you went and sat under in Mexico City. I think that's an important part of the conversation, just like the daytime hours of Mexico City, none of the evening, just sharing the daytime stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to find the best libraries and churches of Mexico City, and I tended to go at night to find those places. Uh, yeah, I put in a lot of work. I, I don't think our success is an accident. It's the evidence of hard work. So I am hyper aware of my background. So I realized I need to learn. So I staged at a lot. Of, staging is when you volunteer to work at a restaurant. So I've worked with Jose Salazar. I worked with Dan Wright. We got a pop up at Forty Thieves, which is a, a restaurant here in Over the Rhine, and I learned on the fly. I got an opportunity to work in a taqueria in Mexico City for a month. I worked from Monday to Thursday during the week, uh, from 8 to 2 a.m. And I, didn't learn, I had to learn Spanish on the fly, and they put me to work. And it was that moment where I was like, you know, I can really do this, because I had to learn on the fly how to work in a high-paced environment without really learning what I, knowing what I was doing. And I did it. And I came back from an experience thinking, you know, I can do this. And ever since then, you know, I've really had to dive head first into the hospitality world. Matt Cuff, if he was here, would say that I annoy him all the time <laughs> because he is someone who has also built his business from the ground up. And he is someone who's helped me so much. And so many other folks in Cincinnati's hospitality and restaurant world have gone above and beyond the call of duty to help me along in my journey. And that's something I guess I say to you guys too. Trust your community. Trust your network. There's great people here that want to help, that want to be supportive, but they won't know that unless you ask for help. Yeah. That's good. That's good. So um, while you two were starting new endeavors, um, I continue to move more forward. Shout out to my entire team. <laughs> um, 
my, my team, I just, actually, let me head that one, and we'll just get rid of this one. There you go. TJ, we'll just some that. water. My team has taken this thing even further than I thought it could go. Um, they have challenged me as a leader. They have helped me become a better leader. They have taught me how to be more trusting um, and how to kind of get out of the way. Um, one of the things that I appreciate, you know, when, when I watch uh, Chef Ramsey on Hell's Kitchen, he does the thing that's like the, um, what's it called? The, the, the pressure test type thing, like where it's like, all right, we got 100 guests out there, make it happen. Um, and earlier this year, I was actually able to go on a month long sabbatical. And it was like, well deserved, but it was, I was nervous at first, because it was kind of like, first off, I've never been off of work anywhere on purpose for a month. <laughs> um, but then also it was having a conversation with myself that everything's going to be fine. You know, so Shannon Putin is my number two. Shout out to Shannon. <laughs> um, so Shannon and Roycelle, actually, their six-year anniversary is coming up on the 21st. So give, give some love to Shannon and Roycelle. Um, but Shannon, Shannon is my number two, and I, I had to trust that she was going to make everything happen, you know? Um, while I was gone, I actually went to Arizona, and I had this experience that was you know, I, it was a, I went to like this mindfulness retreat and I was uh, telling people last time, like I was riding horses, you know, and I was doing <laughs> archery, you know what I mean? Like I was like young Katniss, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, regular black people activities. But um, so it was, it was really cool because I got to do some things that were different and before each activity they made you, they said, think about this and how it relates to other parts of your life. And when I was riding that horse, I had this epiphany. And my horse's name was Lager. I miss him. You know, shout out to Lager. I need to go see him again. Lager? Lager, like a beer. Like a beer. Yeah, because he was the color of like, yeah. But uh, while, you know, before you do the horse ride, and this wasn't like, when I've ridden a horse before, but it was like in a circle, you know, like in a little pen, you know, that was it. But this was like on a trail on some mountains in Arizona. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. So they give you like a 15 minute training. That's it, 15 minutes. And I'm like, yo, I can't be falling off this thing. I got things to get back to. Um, and so they tell you all the things to do for the horse. If you need them to do this, do this, do this. And then if you need them to stop, do this. And if you need, you know, I was like, all right, cool, I got it. So me and Lager, we were cool, like, because when I would pull the reins on Lager, he would kind of look back like, I got this. You ain't got to pull. I saw the horse in front of me stop, so I stopped. You don't have to tell me to stop. I got this. And so one of the things that I took from that is I don't have to be in control of all the things when they have already been trained. Mm. Woo. So I was like, look, my team got this. I don't got to check in every day because they've been trained. They know what they're supposed to do. So I don't have to be in control of all the things. Um, and so I, that was one of the things that was very valuable to me. It has changed the way that I lead, um, where I'm able to kind of get out of the way and trust people to make decisions. And there's still times when I kind of feel like I'm up, and I was like, all right, now I need to back out of it. And it has actually helped me with my stress. Um, so along that line, I wanted to ask you guys, what are your keys to like stress management, especially in the food industry? Like, what are your keys to stress management? What are some of the things that you're doing to maintain your peace and your, like being who you need to be. And I mentioned like, I'm in therapy now and that's like, you know, it's huge. Man, it has, it's changed my life, yeah. like for real. And I, I went to therapy when I was a kid, but like, it's different now. Like, but what are some of the things that you guys have implemented into your lives for self care and just kind of to make sure that you are where you need to be? One, I think Alan is just a big round of applause because the leadership is crazy. Uh, the, way, the way that you've led this organization, the way that you've grown, um, you don't get enough credit for that. And I'm so proud of you. I'm grateful to be your friend. Thank you. Uh, 
ways that I've managed stress. One is I also go to therapy. I have a great therapist. We meet every week. Um, two, I run a lot. Um, I just ran my second marathon a couple weeks ago. Shout out to my runners over there. That's why I keep doing this, because my knees are bad. I just shake them out. Um, yeah, I would say that, that those are two big things for me. I have a question for you. Can he answer that one first? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, so I went on this hippy-dippy trip last summer with... That's on brand. On brand, yeah. <laughs> and we had no phones for four days, we made up fake names, and we couldn't talk about work, et cetera, et cetera. And on the day two, I remember we had a silent disco, and there was this song, it was slapping. I was like, this is fire. And you know, usually in my life, I'm just like, I need to find this so I can enjoy it later. I had no phone to be able to Shazam it or anything like that. And I think, like, I took a lot of life lessons from that, is that we keep pushing enjoyment later, rather than like, you know what, right now, in this current moment, this song is hitting, and that's all that matters. Yeah. So I think with my life, I took a lot from that. I'm trying to enjoy these moments. Mm. Instead of I always think about what's the next thing, what's, what do I need to solve for later, what do I need to enjoy later, and that has helped shift a lot of my mindset around what it looks like to be at peace and, and happy and, and present as well. Smart, that was good. So one thing I remember about a lot of the meetings that Alan and I would go in is that we would have two very different strategies for talking about more. <laughs> I intended to be the person that would talk about tactics, where Al would be the one who talked in very big, grandiose, visionary terms. We would say, he's like the hot air balloon, and I'm like the, the anvil. anvil. Yep. <laughs> very grounded. Alan, <laughs> high in the sky. And I think that that big vision, in a lot of ways, has led us where we are today, on the cusp of opening Mortar Headquarters in Walnut Hills, the <laughs> building. I'm not sure if that would have been possible without Alan's visionary uh, mindset, thinking big, thinking beyond what was possible. So Alan, I'd love for you to kind of share, where did that idea come from? What inspired you to think about the Derner as this place that, well, you talk about it. Tell us what you think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think going, going back to what I said earlier, just being rooted in community, Man, we live streaming. All right, so. <laughs> Say it. We often used to go to a certain co-working space. And sometimes when you walked into said co-working space, it just felt like we weren't supposed to be there. You know, and I was like, we, we putting in work. You know, we're doing something. We're, we're entrepreneurs. And this is supposed to be an environment for entrepreneurs. Um, but there weren't very many people who looked like us in this space. Yeah. And it was almost like when we walked in, you, you know, like on movies when the needle scratches and everybody turns around and looks like, it kind of felt like that. it was like, and then, it's, then you start to feel like, well, maybe we're not supposed to be here. Maybe what we're doing isn't as important as what they're doing. And I didn't want anybody else to ever feel that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was, for me, kind of the seed that was like, yo, we should do something that creates a comfortable environment for people in the community to come and find community. Um, and so in thinking about the Derner, we have a lot of conversations with our alumni, we talk to other entrepreneurs, and really, I think we've done this from the beginning. We try to figure out like, what is the thing that you, if you could do anything, what would you do? What is the gap that you have in your business? What is, what is the thing that, if you had a wish list that you would create? And I think that that's ultimately what it came from. And so in thinking about the Derner building, it's gone through several iterations. This is something that has been a project that we've been talking about since early 2016. Long time. So like some people think like this just happened overnight. This is something that, like we had a press conference with Mayor Cranley in 2016 is that when it was? It was 2016 when we first went in the building. Like, and I, because I, I was looking at the articles recently, I was like, that was 2016. It's crazy. Um, and so, 
And we wouldn't have been ready to do that then. So that's another thing that I've taken from this journey is to trust mm -hmm. God's timing. If we had opened that building in 2016, it would not have been successful, period. We didn't know what we were doing. Sadell so stressed <laughs> out now, just thinking about it. Like, it just, was, the timing wasn't right. And so when you trust God's timing, you're like, look, this is going to happen when it's supposed to. I stopped stressing about it. I was like, if it doesn't happen, it's not supposed to happen. Um, and so it's happening. And we are a month and a half from being done with construction. And in this space, we wanted to create everything that an entrepreneur could need. Um, outside of the community, we wanted to make sure that they had the tools, the resources. So when you walk in the building, there will be a pop-up cafe. So our food entrepreneurs can kind of test out their food concepts. So we'll do a residency there. On the other side, there is a retail space. So we will be able to sell products from our entrepreneurs who have physical products. We'll be able to still have pop-up shops. In the basement, we have a full studio where we'll be able to do podcasts, we'll do things like this, uh, we'll be able to do photography, video, all of those things so that if an entrepreneur needs to get product photos for their website, they can come in and do that. We'll have cameras there and we'll be able to train people on how to do it. So it's not even just having the space, but it's the tools as well. We'll have a co-working space where people can come in, they can have their own private office or dedicated desk or just pop in and kind of just really connect with other people. Um, and then we'll also have a space where people can do convenings, where people can have off-site meetings or workshops. Um, and the space that I'm most excited about um, is our fourth floor, uh, Lexi gave it the name, The Retreat. Um, and ultimately, this space is designed to get away. Um, and it comes from, again, a space of rebellion for me and I, when I went in with model group, I was like, yo, I was talking to Steve, I was like, I want to take the roof off the back of this. And he was like, yeah, they're not going to let you do that. So, because <laughs> we got historic tax credits, so you know, there's, there's per certain parameters you got to operate in. So I was like, what's the next best thing? So what we're going to do is actually inside of that space, we're going to create an outdoor environment inside. Um, so it's going to have uh, turf floors, and it's going to have a deck and seating that feels like it's outside. Uh, we're going to have the Andre 3000 flutes going on through the thing. Like, <laughs> we want people to come in and have morning meditations in this spot. We have a lot of wellness entrepreneurs who do yoga and other things like that, so we'll be able to provide those services as well. And so I'm just really excited about the prospect of not only connecting entrepreneurs with the resources they need to have financial wellness, but also mental wellness and physical wellness. And I think that that's a big part of what this building is. And it's, it's, uh, somebody mentioned this, this word the other day, a reclamation. You mm -hmm. know, thinking about taking Walnut Hills to a place where, kind of returning it to some of its old glory. Uh, Walnut Hills was once called Cincinnati's second downtown with a lot of thriving black-owned businesses. And we want to be one of those entities that continues that trend and is nurturing those businesses who want to help us to get to that place. So that, for me, is, is a big part of the vision for that building. Uh, and I'm excited to welcome everybody in this room to that space because it's, it's going to be a big deal. Yeah. So lastly, uh, to close out, and then we might have time for maybe one, two questions from the audience. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an A and B question. Who do you do this for, and what is the legacy that you hope to leave with the work that you do? <laughs> That's a hard question. Uh, I think that as human beings, we have an obligation to one another. And when we see another person struggling or trying to figure it out, I think that it is uh, the price that we pay for existing to do what we can to make sure that all of us can live joyful, peaceful existences, that we have the space and the opportunity to pursue whatever it is that we want to do in our life. So I think at the end of the day, that is why I wanted to be a part of this because I believe fundamentally that every person should have an opportunity to figure it out. And 
if that doesn't happen, then I think that there's a moral obligation to do something about it. And I thought that entrepreneurship, I believe that entrepreneurship is a pathway towards freedom. And I think at the end of the day, that is why we're here. So in my heart, there's a calling. And that calling is a personal pursuit of freedom and a collective pursuit of freedom. And if God has given me the resources and the tools, then it is my duty and obligation to give those tools to help other people pursue the same things. That's good. <laughs> That was beautiful. Thanks, Blue Team. Um, what a guy. What a guy. <laughs> I do it for my nieces, my great nieces, my family that may not have ever had these opportunities, the community here, all of you all. I think there is this idea that a more free world exists and there are a lot of ways to get to a more free world and a lot of it is being able to believe in the ideas that you have, having the freedom to pursue those ideas and having the support needed. And you know, when it's all said and done, I hope the energy that we've put into this and all of our other individual endeavors has helped create a world where more folks feel the support and the belief in their own ideas to pursue the life that they truly want to in the deepest of their hearts. Mm. Very poetic. Very poetic. Yeah. It's good. I like it. Hmm. I do this for Naptown. Hey. <laughs> uh, go Pacers. Um, I do this for generations before and after. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm in an amazing place to build on the foundation of my family that has come before me, but then also be able to build something with an even firmer uh, foundation for the people who come after me. I do it for my family. Um, shout out to my family. Um, I would not be able to do the work that I do without Kyla. Give it, give it. Yeah. Um, as of yesterday, we've been married for 13 years. I would not be where I am if it weren't for her. And by that, I mean, like, I would not have moved to Cincinnati. <laughs> but also, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for her. Um, and for my girls, Ava and Kelly. Um, They're adults now. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy because Derek and, and Billy and uh, people who have been around Mortar from the beginning have seen them go through all of the phases. Like, Ava used to run into the office and hug everybody. Now you lucky if she says hi. Like, you know, it's just like, <laughs> They've been able to kind of grow with our family, and uh, that was one of the things that kind of really welcomed us in. And you know, so um, I think our legacy is to continue to build up Walnut Hills specifically, and also Cincinnati. Yeah. Um, but we live in Walnut Hills. We love Walnut Hills. Um, so also having a Derner have a home in Walnut Hills means a lot. Um, but. We do this for Cincinnati, we do it for the Midwest. Um, I love the Midwest. I love, I love the fact that the Midwest is so uh, underrated and underestimated. I've always said that we have an opportunity, specifically in Cincinnati, to do whatever we want. Mm. Because when people say Chicago, some pops in your head, you know what it is. You know what Chicago is. If I say New York, you know what it is. When I say Miami, Detroit, all of those cities, you know exactly what they are as soon as I say them. But when people say Cincinnati, for people who haven't been in Cincinnati, they have no idea what it is. So it gives us a unique opportunity to continue to recreate and to, to form what, it, what, what the identity will ultimately be. 
Chicago can't change. It is always going to be Chicago. New York is New York forever. There's no way that it can change what it is from where it is today. But Cincinnati has that unique opportunity to kind of reinvent itself over and over. So if we want it to be an arts mecca, an entrepreneurship mecca, a food capital, like we can make it whatever we want it to be. And that I think is the legacy of Mortar, is paving that road for other people who are going to be the people who ultimately put the jewels in that crown. So I'm thankful for being a part of this legacy and I'm super thankful that I got to do it with y'all. So, we have time for one question. Make it a good one. Two questions, three questions. Make it a good one. Let's we'll start here. Uh, do I just ask it? Yeah, or I don't know if it'll reach. Will it reach? Will it reach? Can you just repeat it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, what is your Okay, so what's your name? Rusana. Rusana? Yeah. Okay, she, she mentioned that she is an entrepreneur of color and has unique challenges building her business. What are the unique things that we bring uh, from a place of mentorship for mm -hmm. entrepreneurs? Okay, so I would say one of the most important pieces, and I will say this all night, community. Um, our alumni program has this, this unique quality of bringing people together. Um, entrepreneurship is really lonely, and I don't think a lot of people talk about that, but it, it can be very lonely. Um, there's a lot of times when you feel like, I'm the only person who's ever felt this thing. I'm the only person who has a business who's going through this. I'm the only person who could have ever thought that this is not gonna work, but it's not real. You know, and so when you start to get in a room with other people and you hear their stories and you're like, oh, okay, I'm not by myself. Oh, you've already experienced that. How did you get to the other side of it? So I think that that's one of the, the things that's a real value proposition that we have with our program. When we, we were doing a lot of research when we first started, and there's a lot of programs around the country who were doing things that were like a nine week program, 10 week, 15. But then there were, with a lot of them, there was kind of a cliff effect. Like after you graduate from the program, it's like, all right, good luck. And so one of the things that we really wanted to invest a lot of time into was building out the alumni program. And so I think that that's one of the, the major value propositions that we bring and how we approach mentorship differently. Um, we, we have done uh, almost like brainstorming sessions or interventions with entrepreneurs. We'll bring them in a room, we'll have our branding person in there, we'll have this person in there, video, like uh, strategy. Like we want to just kind of fully engulf our entrepreneurs with whatever they need and give them room to cry because that happens. Um, I remember the first time I got a call at nine o'clock and somebody was crying and I was like, I, I I'm not the person you want to cry to. Like, Call Derek. <laughs> He'll cry with you. Like, <laughs> but it was just like, okay, like we in here, we in the trenches. Like I didn't know that that was what we were signing up for. But it was like, okay, like then you understand that when people come to you, sometimes they come and they share an idea with you that they haven't even told their family. Like so, in these uh, cohorts of our academy, they become family because there are times, there've been times in cohorts where we've had people tell the people in the room that they were pregnant before they even told their partner. Like legit. Like, so they really have built a family and a, that network is one of the, the ways that we approach uh, entrepreneurship differently and mentorship differently. That's good. Can you repeat? That's just the end part. <laughs> That's what was the last part of the question? <laughs> what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs about trusting yourself and your capabilities for success? Great. 
So the question is, what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs about confidence and trust in yourself? Yeah. That's close. That's close. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, I think at the end, it's so important that you got to believe in your idea to start out with. And if you don't fully believe in your idea, there's going to be a million naysayers that's going to tell you why you shouldn't believe in your idea. And the second piece is thinking, like, what would Kanye do? <laughs> <laughs> old Kanye. Old, old Kanye. Kanye. What would old Kanye do? <laughs> but for real, that dude believes in himself and his ideas more than true. anybody else. That's true. No matter what. That's and I think true. we all got to embody a little bit of that, that weird spirit that he has. Even if it's, you know, dialed down 50%, we still have that idea that we are the ones to carry out this idea. And if it's in our heart and our soul, like, we are the ones to do it. And I think there's no other if, and, buts, or maybes. And I think we can talk ourselves out of it. And there's like, you know, there's the little head the idea, but then there's this bigger part inside of you. And you gotta let that bigger part inside of you really drive everything that you do. That's good, Bill. Two things to add. One, I think it's really important to release the, like, end result. Because it's all about the adventure. It's all about learning every single day. There's something new for you to learn. Even failure is a lesson. And once you're able to see those things as something you can learn and improve and then move on, I think the easier the process becomes. The second thing I would say is you're never really alone. There's, mm. of course, people around you, but there's also your faith. And I have grown so much in my faith because there's been so many times where I'm sitting in a room and I'm like, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my employees. I don't know how I'm gonna pay my rent. I don't know how I'm gonna afford a meal for myself. This is a very transparent thing I'm gonna say. Last January or February, I got an eviction notice on my door. I was down bad. And I had to rely on my faith that God was gonna provide a way even though I couldn't see the way in front of me. And here I am with a restaurant on Court Street. Talk to him. <laughs> so, yes, there's confidence in yourself, but you're also not alone. There's something that it's hard to explain that will be with you if you continue to move forward. That's good. That's good. There was somebody back there. Nope. Good. Okay. We're done? Oh, there we go. <laughs> So I, I don't, I don't necessarily have mantras. I do have like random. I don't know. Drake songs. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you got me. I, I think that one of the things is how you do er anything is how you do everything. Um, so, and this is one of the things that I often share with our newer entrepreneurs. Uh, especially the ones who are just going through the, the academy, if you are slacking on doing the you know, work that we assign in the class, um, you're gonna slack when it's time to run your business. You know, if, you, if you're not gonna get up to make it to the meeting with the person who could be you know, your next client and you blow that off, you're gonna continue to do that. So, and I try to, be a man of my word, so if I say I'm gonna do something, I'm, unless something like severe happens, I'm going to do it. Now there's a lot of times I say, yeah, I'm gonna do something, and then it gets to that day, and I'm like, I do not wanna do that. But I'm gonna still show up, because I've already put it out there that I'm going to, and I wanna honor my word. So I think that for me, it's uh, how you do anything is how you do everything, and then just to be kind of true to your word. I listen to Kanye, St. Pablo. <laughs> Great song. Thanks. I think just the idea that everything always works out in some way. And, yeah. you know, you make a decision, you stand 10 toes down on that decision. 
And sometimes it's the wrong one and sometimes it's the right one, but at the end it all will work out and everything's gonna be okay. Yeah. All right. Felicia? I wanna ask a question about pivoting. I think COVID taught us that you gotta duck, dodge, pivot. How do you guys pivot? Because I know you get stuck with like one idea that doesn't work out. Like we talked a little bit about like when you work with one pivot that you thought you were gonna do and it didn't work out to a different direction. No, that's a good question. Um, she asked about how do you how do you pivot? How do you make those decisions? Um, I think that for me, I'm only married to one thing in this world, and that's my wife. So I'm not married to decisions, yep. um, and so you have to understand that a decision can change. And I think that a part of understanding when those decisions change because you're not married to it, it's also communicating that. Because a lot of times what we find is that people will kind of hide when things look difficult or different, they don't communicate that to the other people. So like if it goes a different direction, it's like you still gotta have the same confidence that you had the first decision that, hey, you know, that didn't work, so we're gonna go a different direction. So I think it's, um, understanding, weighing the differences, um, and sometimes it is, you know, doing a SWOT analysis. Sometimes it's a list of pros and cons. Sometimes it's having a trusted advisor. Um, and so there's a lot of times when I will reach out to Shannon and I say, "Hey, I'm thinking about such and such. What do you think about that?" And you have to have people around you who will not lie to you. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important parts of any entrepreneurial journey, anybody who wants to go anywhere, you cannot surround yourself with people who will only say yes. And for me, Derek was always that person. So as he, as he mentioned that analogy of like, I am the, the hot air balloon, I think we can go, we can go anywhere we wanna go. And he's like, yeah, but reality is, and it's like, damn, like, can I live in it a minute? But, but you need that person in your life to say, have you thought about this? And then you have to also not be defensive about that. And that was another, like, because when Derek talked about, you know, like, I felt like when this, when you say this, you, you really are just attacking me. And it's like, I was super defensive. Like, because if I really believe in an idea and I feel like you crapping on my idea, if, you know, but it's not that. It's like, but if you have that person you trust that you can go to and say, hey, I'm thinking about this, what are your thoughts? And you have to be able to listen to them, listen to their why, and then ultimately, as the business owner, it's up to you to make the decision, but having those trusted advisors, in the same way that people have boards and people, you know, you should have a, a group of advisors around you that you can assemble and say, hey, I got this thing I'm thinking about and I wanna understand what you guys would do in that circumstance. Um, and trust them to give you, to be honest with you, um, thank them even if you disagree, and thank them and respect the, the perspective, but ultimately it's gonna be on you to make that decision. Yeah. All right, well, thank you guys for being here.